choir, thank you. And um, uh, Jennifer and Ella, thank you very much. You sounded a lot like Joel. Um, when, oh, when I think of Joel, though, he, uh, uh, he'll step up here and he'll say, how's everybody doing? And they'll, uh, they'll respond. And he always enjoys hearing it because he'll say, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, that's, that's what I think Joel does. Uh, uh, and so, uh, my Christian friends seeing you out there, I'm glad to hear it. Um, let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, again, we come before you in this place and this time, knowing that by the very presence of your spirit among us, this becomes for us a sacred place, a sacred time. And by your spirit, we pray that you will become your own interpreter of the words that we read this day. May they leap from the page and take root and engraft themselves within our hearts, within our souls, that we may embody your written word, that we may bring life by your spirit to your incarnate word in us. Speak your words to us that we may be the presence of Christ in the world, not by our merits, but by the merits of your Son, who sends us forth into the world empowered by your grace, which you proclaim to us this day, empowered by your grace, which allows us to be compassionate and loving to the world, just as you have been for us. Make us truly grateful for the words you speak to us this day. We pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Our scripture lection for this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. This passage, uh, I, I'm going to become a little uh, bit of a, a, a biblical uh, uh, analyst at this point and just share with you this in the way of introduction. This passage is uh, a saying of Jesus that we find in only one other gospel. We find it in Matthew, we find it in Luke, and it is a, uh, it's what we categorize in literary form as a saying. Uh, and uh, uh, we attribute this to a source material called Q, uh, German for quella, which means fancy German word meaning source. Uh, and, and this Q, by the way, is an, um, a, a two-century-old um, um, uh, hypothesis put forward by biblical scholars. Uh, Q is not the, uh, the conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theorist material you see out there in the world, uh, because the biblical <coughs> scholars owned the term Q before it became part of uh, popular parlance. Um, that said, uh, what we know about, uh, about the Q source, about uh, Matthew and, uh, and Luke have access to it while they're writing their Gospels. They know the, the, the life story of Jesus, but they also have not only that source in front of them, but they also have this, this collection of Jesus' sayings. Somebody wrote down Jesus' uh, teachings somewhere along the line, and Matthew and Luke have it in front of them. They just don't know the, the narrative context in which Jesus said all of these things that are written in that Q source. And so they'll plug them in where they think they belong in their Gospels. The reason I mention this is that's very critical in understanding uh, this reading today because this is a, uh, a warning and it is a lament about Jerusalem. In Matthew's gospel, Matthew places it while Jesus is in Jerusalem looking at the cross or getting ready to face the cross. Seems like an appropriate place for it. But here in Luke's gospel, Jesus is still many chapters away from entering Jerusalem. He's still conducting his, his public ministry in the region of Galilee. And while in Galilee, suddenly he starts lamenting Jerusalem. What an odd place for it to happen. And yet there is a reason that Luke has us read this story while set in this Galilean uh, background. Uh, and again, uh, be mindful that uh, in this story, uh, Jesus will be offering both a warning and a lament. The warning uh, because he thinks there's a danger afoot for not only himself, but for the people of Jerusalem and for people like you and me reading the story. And a lament because the people aren't listening to the warning. And Jesus feels um, sorrowful for the people who will not heed the warning. With that as our introduction, I say to you, my Christian friends, listen for the word of God. 
At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing. And you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen, and may God give us to understand this reading of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. I know some of you are probably looking around at each other wondering, well, yes, I'm going to have to have the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to understand this one. What in the world does this mean? Um, especially in this context. Uh, Jesus is not in Jerusalem. He's not in Jerusalem. He's, he's uh, quite a good distance away. And I'm, I'm just going through my mind, just trying to guess the distance. It's probably about 40 or 50 miles away in the region of Galilee. These, though, are faithful words, my Christian friends. These words clarify in advance both Jesus' fate and the fate of Jerusalem. Because we do know historically, after the death and resurrection of Jesus in the year 70 AD, Jerusalem will fall. The temple will be destroyed by the Romans. Jesus is being rather proleptic in his prediction. Jesus is saying here, knowing that Herod intends to kill him, Herod Antipas, who is the Tetrarch of Galilee, who is... Uh, uh, who, he's a pretend king, if you will, but, uh, but governs in the region of Galilee. He has the power to seek Jesus' life. Jesus is not somehow or other trying to avoid his death. He's simply acknowledging that it won't be at the hands of Herod, that fox. His death must happen where all prophets go to die, Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem, which should be the city of the prophets, is the very city which turns against the very ones who are speaking God's word to them. Historically, that's what Jesus is referring to, how the prophets of old were persecuted in the city of Jerusalem. Jesus says he will not be killed by Herod. He will go to be killed in Jerusalem. He will be killed in Jerusalem as the prophets had been killed and eventually come again as the Savior, as the Redeemer. Jerusalem will reject Jesus. Jerusalem will kill Jesus and therefore will be abandoned. He uses this interesting phrase, uh, see your house is left to you, implying that your house, your temple, your um, uh, your abode, your living is going to be turned over to you. It's no longer going to be in God's hands. God is just going to hand it to you. Good luck. Because you are turning your back on God, God is just going to turn, the, turn everything over to you. Have at it. You think you can do a great job, Jerusalem? It's yours. That's what that phrase means. Turning the house over to you. Jerusalem will not see Jesus until... He comes as the Redeemer of the world after the fact, after he is crucified, after the resurrection. Only then will they be able to recognize him as Redeemer, as Savior. These are prophetic words, the, the warning and the lament. 
For Jesus laments over Jerusalem, and it's a, and it's a lament uh, said because Jerusalem will not heed the warning. Now, it's time, I think, that I actually try to explain a little bit now. You heard me in the introduction explain why uh, the, this, this text is used in both Matthew's gospel and in Luke's gospel. Jesus says these words, but why is it that it, you know, it seems to make sense in Matthew's gospel. Jesus stands in Jerusalem. He is, it's, it is uh, his time after the, the triumphal entry. He's spending the last week of his life in Jerusalem. It seems appropriate while standing in Jerusalem to lament Jerusalem, to warn Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets. That makes sense. Seems to. So you have to ask the question, why is Luke being premature? Why does Luke place it here? Jesus hasn't gone to Jerusalem. Now, strangely enough, in chapter 9 of Luke's gospel, uh, Jesus sets his eyes toward Jerusalem. But he won't go to Jerusalem for several more chapters. He's still conducting his Galilean ministry. He's still several miles from Jerusalem. Why deliver this lament, this warning, in a place where it can't properly be heard? Why is Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem and not doing it in Jerusalem? Why does he prematurely recount this in Galilee? And the reason is that Jesus, uh, Luke puts it here because it suggests two possible alternatives for those who hear it. And for those of us who read it today. And those two alternatives are represented in animal imagery. One is the fox. On one side lurks the fox. And uh, by the way, I find it kind of interesting. Uh, Herod is referred to as a fox here because he desires to devour Jesus, in a manner of speaking, like a predatory animal would. Uh, what I find interesting is how the Pharisees are looking out for Jesus. Uh, they don't do that anywhere else, but here in this text, the Pharisees somehow or other are, are uh, saying, hey, Jesus, you know, get out of here. Uh, Herod's coming to get you. Um, boy, that, uh, uh, boy, I'll tell you what, the love of the Pharisees for Jesus has been lacking of late, hasn't it? Um, but here it is. I, I don't know, for some reason that just surprises me that it's the Pharisees who are trying to warn Jesus. Um, maybe that's another sermon. Uh, but uh, note here that uh, Jesus identifies uh, Herod as a fox, as a predatory animal. This is not unusual in Scripture. All throughout both Old and New Testaments, uh, we see that uh, predatory animals are used to represent evil, to represent sin, that try to take hold of us and devour us. Satan is a serpent in, uh, chapter, in Genesis chapter 3. The devil prowls around like a lion. In First Peter, there's uh, the wolves come and snatch God's sheep, like sin taking hold of God's people in both Matthew's gospel and in John chapter 10. Evil is described as a kind of a plague of locusts or scorpions that come out of the bottomless pit in the book in the book of Revelation. And even the devil is in the book of Revelation is described as a great red dragon with with uh, seven heads and ten horns coming to devour Christians. Evil devours us. Sin devours us. As a representative of, of the powerful who oppress God's people, Herod is aptly depicted as a fox, a devouring fox. But the imagery doesn't stop there. On the other side of this imagery, of this lurking fox, of this, this uh, predatory fox, is a mothering hen. And I, I want, this is something that requires us to, to give some... I, I do need to have a little excursus here, by the way, my Christian friends, in talking about the imagery that Jesus offers about being a hen who shelters her brood under the shadow of her wing to protect her young from the fox. Most of the time, we allow ourselves to be drawn into the masculine symbolisms of God in Scripture, especially using terms like Father for God and Son for Jesus Christ. Again, nothing wrong with those theological terms, but many times, all too often, we simply associate masculinity with the divine character, with the divine compassion. When Scripture offers us a number of examples of God 
as the feminine, as God as the mother, as the mother who would sacrifice her life for her children. That imagery is in the Bible, needs to have more credit given to it. And Jesus is making reference to it here. We find um, in the Old Testament, for example, in the Psalms, you'll find that uh, uh, the steadfast love of God in, cha in uh, Psalm chapter 36 is, is uh, uh, defined or described as uh, uh, God sheltering us under the shadow of his wing, like a hen. In Psalm 17, we are the apple of God's eye. If you ever wonder where that phrase comes from, the apple of, your, of my eye, it comes from, from Scripture. It's, it's Psalm 17. We are the apple of God's eye under the protection of God's sheltering wing. Like a hen protecting her young. Or Isaiah talking about the, the remnant of Israel that will survive. Because God will not forget his people any more so than a mother can forget her nursing child. That's Isaiah 49. There are, there are feminine imagery, maternal imagery of God in Scripture. And Jesus is making use of that here. He's, he is saying that he, as an emissary of God, is that sheltering wing for the young. Alas, the young will not gather together under the wing. That's why he laments. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing, and you are not willing. Imagine the frustration of the mother trying to protect her children and the children simply go running after the fox. This is the frustration Jesus has. Now, these words are words of hope, my Christian friends, believe it or not. And it is a lament, but there is hope built into it. The very reason that Luke tells us this means that Luke believes there is hope in the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. The mothering hen trying to protect her children. These words clarify in advance both Jesus' judgment and Jesus' redemption. In this world of, of symbols that Jesus has spelled out for us, evil threatens us in the form of a fox. The mother hen laments. Her young are exposed but will not accept the protection. What more can she do? What more can Christ do? but give his life for the world. Jesus Christ stands up to the fox. She shelters and protects her young. My Christian friends, we have to ask ourselves this question, what will become of the young if they do not accept the shelter of their mother's wing? What will happen to the people of Jerusalem if they don't heed the warning that Jesus is offering? What will happen to you and me if we do not turn from the lure of evil and sin and turn to the sheltering and gracious love of Jesus Christ? This is the power of the statement in, its, in its, its premature location in the story. It's placed here because it hasn't happened yet so to speak. Luke places it here to show us that there is still a chance. Jesus isn't in Jerusalem yet. Jesus hasn't faced the cross yet. At the time that this story is, this, this lament and this warning are being told. Luke places it here because he wants us to hear the words that there is still a journey to be had. We read it at this time of year because we are on that journey. We haven't reached Holy Week. We haven't reached Good Friday yet. Evil still, we still have a chance to turn from the lure, the devouring power of evil and sin. And to look forward to being able to say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord on Easter Sunday. To be able to see Jesus Christ 
not as some prophet that we're going to kill in Jerusalem, but to see him as our redeemer who will lift us up from our danger. This is the premature, this is, this is the premature location of the lament. Luke is saying there is yet time to repent. There is still time for us to change. There's still time for us to turn around. There is still time to receive pardon of sin and to welcome the reign of God in our lives. That offer continues. It continues. That's the good news of the gospel. It's never too late to turn. It's never too late to change. We do this every year. We go through the season of Lent every year because we have to remind ourselves that the lure of the fox, the lure of evil, is always real. It's always there. The predator is always at the door. The good news is there is also the sheltering wing of a maternal god. Will we gather under the wing or will we run after the fox? Will we heed the warning or, we will, or will we simply be another reason for Jesus Christ to lament? Amen and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name.